So, okay, so to start off, um, I just want to kind of quickly overview like what our learning objectives were. I think we've crossed off the top three because we got done with our conversation of lexical scoping last time. And what we have for tonight is highlight some of the properties of lazy evaluation. So we're going to talk and dive in a little bit more about what lazy evalu evaluation is and how it modifies like function behaviors. Uh, we're also going to overview some of the tools that are available to exit out of a function. There are different techniques that we can use. And then over our, our overview of the three forms used to compose functions. And I think that will be pretty much where we'll wrap up. So last time we were last time we ended our discussion here about talking about lexical scoping. And as just like a quick review, um, I did provide those two example or this example post that kind of does a, a, a deeper dive into um, how R is lexically scoped and it goes through creating an argument of how it is lexically scoped rather than dynamically scoped. So, um, but that blog post that I posted gave like a good definition for me, at least to kind of get a good mental model of what scope actually means and what lexical scoping means. Then we discussed the rules. We covered name masking, functions versus variables. We discussed um, a fresh start dynamic and dynamic lookup and how those all apply within functions. And we kind of ended up with this discussion of this example here. And we kind of ended up discussing that this was kind of a good example of a good majority of these rules and this example being taken from those blog posts that I, I linked earlier. And then we talked a little bit about this debugging. So looking at some of the function dependencies and especially looking at certain or how things were defined. And so we could use this uh, function called find globals to see what our function depends on outside of the scope of the function. And so we were talking about that a little bit. We did a little bit of clarification because my mental model wasn't as clear as it probably could have been, but this is kind of where we ended up last time. And so from this, we extend into lazy evaluation. And so this is new material. So with lazy evaluation, one behavior of functions that we need to take into consideration is, is that they're lazy with their arguments. And so function arguments only evaluate, evaluate when they're accessed. So when we talk about this, um, this is a good example here with this example taken from the book. This is highlighting how functions are lazy and they only access their arguments when they're needed. You can see here, we define this function H01, we just give it the value 10. But then as we pass an argument into X here, using the explicit stop, which we'll talk about here a little bit later when we talk about um, X, when we talk about errors, this stop will break the function or it should break the function but in the case of lazy evaluation, because it's defined here inside of the parentheses as an argument, it doesn't get used within the function. So if it doesn't get used, the function's not going to evaluate it. And so this error does not actually work and it just returns the value 10. And so to kind of dive a little bit more, um, the book kind of talks about this idea of a promise. I'll be honest, I did not completely understand what a promise is. Um, I kind of dug a little bit more, tried to reread it again, but I still don't understand what a promise is outside of it being like, it is a data structure. And I was just going to say that that's like, that's as far as I got, which is, it is indeed a data structure. So that's, that, that's, that's super helpful on that part. Sorry. I, um, that was, you're not alone. That's what I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like and it had like different components to it too. Like it was talking about like it had needed to have like values or like some I can't remember. There's some other components to it too as well. But then towards the end of that conversation of it being powered by a promise, it's like, hey, we're gonna talk about this later. So like if you don't totally get this, that's okay. So, but just know that I guess the takeaway message is just know that it's it's powered by a structure called a promise. Um. And what's nice about lazy evaluation is it affords us some things that we can do with functions and the function arguments. And one of them being that it allows us to have default arguments. So if we look at this example, H04, we can provide default arguments to our functions that if a user decides that they don't want to, um, if they don't want to specify a function or an argument value, the function will just default to that value. So x equals one, in this case, will um, explicitly evaluate to one because of lazy evaluation. 
the other thing that's not, the other thing that the book talks about is it provides flexibility to create functions that have long running computations. So what you can do is in your function, you could have uh, a section of it, maybe using some type of conditional, like a, an if else statement or an if else conditional, where basically you give the user the power to select if you want some computation to happen through the use of arguments. And I'm thinking of like a true false Boolean or something where like if the user says specifies true, then this long running computation will run because of this function. And so, oh, oh, there's a fox outside my window. Sorry, I just caught my eye. There's a red tail fox. Hmm, interesting. Um, anyway, sorry, <laughs> squirrel, sorry. Um, but- That's, um, that's funny. <laughs> We don't really usually see them, and now a red tail fox, or a, yeah, it's just well, anyways. Anyways, um, so with the default functions, uh, so if we wanted to, what we could do is, is we could have a part of our function that, if it's passed a certain argument, can run this long running computation. But we may not necessarily always want that with our functions, so we can set a default value to not do that long running computation um, if we don't want it. And it also discusses this concept that you can also specify default argument values that depend on values inside of the function. Uh, it says that the book says you can do this, but then the book at the end is like, you can do this, but you shouldn't do this. So, but it also says that base R functions kind of do this sometimes. And so just be aware of it. But I don't think I would ever do anything like this where like the values of the arguments were dependent on the values defined in the function but i don't know it, does anybody in the group see any use for this no i mean i think that kind of thing looks non-intuitive so i would try to stay away from things that are hard to read like that it, right i mean it makes it, it it makes you have write only code somehow i think <laughs> Later, later. I know if I wrote something like that, and I came back later and looked at it, I'm like, what is this thing even doing? I have no idea. Like, just like when I first looked at this example, it just took me a little bit to parse it. I mean, it's a really simple See? example, but yeah. it like, when you look at it, you're like, okay, well, A is here, it's A is defined here, then here's B, and then B here. So it's just, yeah, you, you, lazy evaluation gives you the ability to do this, but should you do this, the book concludes that you shouldn't do it. So just be aware of that. So um, the environment, so the environment oh, for the, uh, those promises must be the functions environment, I guess. I don't know, something to think about for the next chapter. <laughs> I try to actually try to understand how our, what our does there, but. I don't yeah, know. I mean, yeah, I'm not sure. Like the promises section for me, just it got lost because like I just was like, yeah, I just got lost from it. I mean, outside of it, that it's a data structure and it has three basic components and expression. And well, you said environment, so it might have its own environment. Um, but this was just it was way over my head. So. But maybe we'll get to it. <laughs> um, sweet. Any other questions regarding lazy evaluation? Okay, sweet. Uh, so the dot, dot, dot. Uh, this one is probably one of my favorite, uh, like one of my favorite kind of components that you can add within your function arguments. And I think it's kind of a really neat idea. Uh, I'll start off with kind of the general example from the book, and then I'll provide a more applied example of, of places where I've seen it or where I've used it before. Um, but this first one here, basically we have this function I01 with two arguments, Y and Z. And we put that into a list object here, y equals y, z equals z. So we could define it this way, but we could simplify what's getting put into this list by just using the dot, dot, dot. And basically what the dot, dot, dot is doing here in the function is it's just taking, just passing along any additional arguments that you have into I01. So, and I actually said that wrong because I said this was two different, or this was the same function, but it's not. This is I01, which defines the list here, and then I02, which has this argument dot, 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 which then you can pass in those arguments to I01 to put it into the list. And that's what this example is doing, is it's just pr printing out that list element here. But the way you can kind of think of it is, is the dot, dot, dot just passes along argument values. And so 
the user can pass along, if you have a dot, dot, dot defined in it, the user can pass along any number of arguments onto any number of functions that you use inside of your function. Now, this may seem kind of a little too general. So I decided to maybe, I decided to create kind of a more applied example. And so what I have here is I've created two um, wrapper functions around some ggplot2 code. And all this ggplot2 code does is it just creates a scatter plot. Um, and so what we do is I create this kind of wrapper function. But um, if you're not familiar with ggplot2, um, basically what, it, what AES is or aesthetic is that's where you pass along your variables that you want to map onto your X and Y variables. And so and rather, rather instead of saying X and Y up here or defining those arguments explicitly, I just decided to put the dot, dot, dot here and then put the dot, dot, dot to AES. And then that gives the user the flexibility to pass any of these arguments into AES. And so here's another example. So here's a scatter plot, um, just using empty cars, looking at miles per gallon for the weight of a car. And then say, I wanna look at the size of an engine as represented by the variable displacement. You could do this here, y equals MPG, x equals displacement. Um, and it, it still works because of that dot, dot, dot. Now, that's, what's nice, cool. I'll go. That's, yeah, that's, it's that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's really, it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice feature. I mean, there's some disadvantages, which we'll talk about here in a second, but it basically is just an ability for you to allow your user to pass along how many ever arguments you want to pass along. So what other comments or questions do people have about um, dot, dot, dot? That was actually the best like explanation. I, I have, um, maybe I haven't paid enough attention over the years, but I've never fully gotten that whole construct. So that was, that was a pretty cool example. <clears throat> yeah, I think what you see like the general examples, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but then like when you actually see it applied in a situation where you might use it, it makes a lot more sense. Holy now, <laughs> Now, the problem is, is that this isn't always the best way to do this, because what happens is, is your user, I mean, depending on what your function is and what your function does, like I said, this gives them the flexibility to pass anything into AES. So you need to be careful because if there's some other arguments of this AES function that you don't want your user to have access to, which in this case, it's trivial, but, um, you know, any function that's defined in, in, in ggplot's AES function could be passed and used by your user in this case. So it just provides a lot of flexibility, which is really, really nice. I mean, you can pass a lot of different values into AES beyond just X and Y. And so it's really nice. Uh, so there's some additional uses to this. These uh, I kind of understood. Uh, if your function takes a function as an argument, you'll want some way to pass additional arguments to that function. So I thought this statement basically was the idea of a wrapper function. Like this is a wrapper function. Like you are wrapping around ggplot2 code. So you want to give your user ability to pass along additional arguments. And so they're not just constrained to the arguments that you give them. So um, this one I didn't fully understand because I don't really totally understand S3 generics just yet. But if your function is an S3 generic, you need some way for all of your methods to take arbitrary extra arguments. And so um, I, I vaguely understand S3, but basically that with an S3 object, you can define methods and methods are, and again, if anybody's out here watching this later, if I'm wrong, you can just tell me I'm wrong, but methods can be functions. And so you need a way for people, if they're gonna use that S3 object to pass along any number of arbitrary arguments into that S3 object, and so the dot, dot, dot is super important in this case. Um, but then the book says, hey, we're going to come back to this topic yeah. again. So, <laughs> but, um, and then I think the last thing uh, before I open it up for any other additional questions for dot, dot, dot is, you know, there's some downsides to using the dot, dot, dot. Although it provides a convenience to us for our functions, there's also some disadvantages for using it. Um, one of them being that when used to pass arguments to other functions, you have to explain to the user where they go, right? So in your documentation of your function, you would want to basically define what other additional arguments might be important to which they, they can pass on. So in this case here, with this wrapper function around ggplot2, I might also be able to say, hey, if you want to color different, you know, 
different categories of um, different categories of sections in the in the plot, you can pass along an additional argument to do that. So, um, okay. The other downside is, is if you misspell an argument, you're not going to get an error. So in this case, if we look at just this this, this basic this simple example, here's the sum function. We're summing these two values. Are these this these three values one, two, um, n a? If we have n a r m equals true when it should be n a dot r m, we spelled the argument wrong. It's not going to tell us what's wrong, right? It's because n a dot r m should be used for sum, but because we're using the dot, dot, dot in this case here for some, it's not going to work out. So then we won't get the error. So any other question, any additional questions or comments regarding um, the dot, dot, dot? Yeah, I guess just to, your, to what your point is, it's, um, yeah, it seems like it's a good example of, it's it's a cool feature, but it also has, concerns <laughs> you know what i mean like you know like, um and it seems like there's a lot of that in this book where it's um how do i say this like um yeah there's a lot of things where it seems like you know things that are designed to make using it easier but then it's like we, we don't always want to have it be easier we want things to be explicit you know what i mean isn't that one of the things we're kind of hearing in the book more and more is, you know, make your assumptions explicit, not implicit. I agree. I think that is, so. Uh, that seems to be a, a common, I think R has a history, like coming from this other language S that was, has a lot of shortcuts, right? You know, how they did not shortcuts, but they did things in a way that make it seem easy at the time, you know, so mm -hmm. it's, it's a little bit sloppy in some places, I would say, I don't want to be, you know, not, being critical necessarily but it was it served a purpose but now people are trying to like roll that back a little bit because now people realize that hey these things aren't they may be they may be quick and dirty but they're also not very safe so we probably mm -hmm. should there's even a movement out there to roll back the lazy evaluation and have it eager by default in r because the, somebody did a study and like hardly anybody really takes advantage of lazy evaluation in r <laughs> so i was I trying to find that. that to post it now if i'll keep looking for it if i find it i'll post it but uh, but that's to your point. Yeah, it looks like that there are people like, especially I would say the, the author of this book um, is really pushing that a lot. Like he's kind of the vanguard of that movement, it seems like to me. Well, I think, and sorry, my, my cats were fighting on their tree. So I had, oh, to, no. kick one, I had to kick one out. So um, anyways, uh, so if I didn't catch all the comments and I'm repeating something, just let me know. But I, I think when it comes to lazy evaluation, you know, you got to think about the initial design of R. And again, I don't, I'm not going to say I'm, I know everything about R, but it was designed for interactive data analysis. But as people started using it more, more and more for like general programming, lazy evaluation becomes even more important, especially in the context of uh, shiny development, because you're developing a web app. Uh, you don't want computation to happen all the time. And so you lean on latency evaluation to only do the computation you need at specific times. And so it's a very, it's a very important characteristic of R that helps out in just kind of general like programming situations. So but, but some more strictness would be nice, but at the same time, <laughs> I also like the flexibility of it too. <laughs> It, it, I wasn't necessarily saying like the flexibility was bad. It's just like that just seems to be like kind of like a double edged or a paradoxical thing where they're like, he, Hadley keeps kind of saying, yeah, this is cool, but just be careful because sometimes you might not get what you think you're going to get. You know what I'm saying? It's like there's this sort of warning of unintended consequences if you do it like X, or, you know, the easier way or what. I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe Ron, I'm not. Maybe I'm not making sense, but anyway, that was, that's kind of what I thought. But yeah, I, I do think the dot, dot, dot is pretty cool. I, I think you're on the right track. I mean, there's opportunities for you to, there's more opportunities and flexibility to shoot yourself in the foot in this programming language, right? So like the flexibility provide, like you said, a double-edged sword, it gives you a lot of conveniences, but there's also a lot of situations where you could, you know, shoot yourself in the foot basically so yeah. um 
Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I was just saying, yep, but I agree. <laughs> so let's move on to talking about exiting a function. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about this, but I think most of the stuff is pretty straightforward, but the book talked about it. So I think we need to cover it. Um, there's this idea of different ways to exit a function. And so the first one, the first kind of concepts is the idea of implicit versus explicit returns. And then this concept of invincibility, uh, one of the examples of invincibility being our assignment arrow is the most famous function that returns an invisible value. Uh, stop, which is an explicit break or stop at function, especially in the case of an error. And then exit handlers, which we'll talk a little bit more about here in a second. Um, so with implicit versus explicit, I think this is pretty straightforward, but you have two options to, um, you have two options to return values uh, with it, with your functions. Um, you have implicit return, which basically when you think about a function, a function is always going to return the last value that it has, um, the last value that it computes. And so it implicitly just does that. And so when you define your functions, and here we have this example from the book, um, we just have this J01 function that's defined. It has a conditional with an if else, really simple. If X, the argument X is below 10, we get zero, else it's 10. Uh, the last computation that happens will get returned. And so depending on what we pass into it, five, it's gonna return zero and 15, it's gonna return 10. And so basically with this, we don't have to explicitly give a statement that says, hey, return this value or return this value. However, we can also be explicit with our return values uh, using this function called return. And so it's the same function, but all we do is we just add this explicit return value into it. Now, I've heard conversations from other cohorts talk about this, especially if they work within a team. Uh, some teams expect that you should be explicitly returning your values. Um, and so there are some people that have a specific style guide that say, hey, when you define a function, you need to explicitly use this return function because it's more clear. Now, do, are you expected to do that? No, because you can explicitly return it. But there, I've heard of some people saying like, especially if they work in a team, like and people are writing functions is you need to explicitly use this return function so people know what is explicitly being returned. So I think this is pretty straightforward, um, but does anybody have any questions about this idea of implicit versus explicit returns? I only would have the comment that I, this is something I really like about R because I don't know how many times writing Python, I forget to say return X or whatever the heck I'm trying to do. And I, I think I'm just you know writing an expression, just return the expression. That's what you should always do. I think where this bites me is just like, if I think where this is, has like bitten me in the past is like, if I write like some type of loop, so, or not some loop, but if I use some type of map function, which is basically a loop, um, what happens is if I have a function defined for that loop and I have something that at the end of it in the function that's defined like sys.sleep, like sys.sleep3, which if you're not familiar with that, just pauses execution for like three or how many ever seconds. What happens is, is that when that loop keeps running, because that's the last thing that is implicitly returned in the function, nothing gets returned as a result of that function. And so that's where I feel like return comes in because you're explicitly saying return this value at the end of the loop, return this value at the end of the loop rather than like sys.sleep, which doesn't return anything. So, but... So the next kind of concept is this idea of invisible values. Um, most functions that we work with in R are going to pr uh, print a result to the console. So that means that they are visible, but you have the opportunity to return things invisibly by applying this function called invisible. And so we have this example from the book, J04, defining this function using invisible, and it's just gonna return one. Um, if we run this function, you can see that nothing gets returned but we can verify it still works by saying string with visible J04, we can say that it, we can see that it returns that value one. Uh, an example, the most common example of where this is used is with the um, assignment arrow. You know, every time that we assign a variable or assign a value, we don't necessarily want to have something printed to the console. So it returns things invisibly. 
Uh, what's also interesting about this is that this is the characteristic that allows us to chain our um, to chain our assignment. So we can use this A, B, C, D, and two being the value. And because the the assignment arrow returns things invisibly, we don't get like a bunch of like printing to our console. So, but. I'm trying to think of another area where invisible might be used, but I don't know. I'm going to open up to the group if if anybody's ever used invisible for anything. I was just thinking the same thing. I'm like, I I, I think I have, but I can't even remember what it is that I did. But yeah, I I yeah, I, I don't know, Ron. You have any good examples? No, I mean, I, did, I only just learned about it when reading this chapter. I've never knew that was a thing. I think I may have seen it somewhere, but I've never used it. Other languages that I've used use like a semicolon or something after the function call to make it suppress the output. But in, in other words, it's not part of the function. It's something you do to a function. But yeah, I think it might it might be useful in cases where you don't want, like where you're just interested in the side effects of the function. So like if you're just making a change to the system or some system that you're working in and you don't want things to get printed out, it might be useful, but I don't know. It's, it's, it's something that you could use. Um, another thing that gets talked about when we talk about exiting a function is errors. And I don't think I need to spend too much time talking about errors because most of us have, have experienced an error but um, how we how we ex how we uh, express an error in a function is we use stop. Uh, stop is an immediate stop. So once stop gets evaluated, the function uh, stops and it expresses that it's a it's it's in a failed state. And so one thing that we need to know about errors, and again, most of us have this experience, is, is that when we see an error, that should communicate to our user or the people using our function that there is something wrong that needs to be fixed. Now we'll talk more about, um, I can't uh, here, I think in chapter eight, we're gonna talk about uh, conditions and that's gonna talk more about some of the other like kind of messages and other stuff and warnings that we can use within our functions. But it's just kind of talking about that this is a way to exit our function explicitly, which is just using stop. And that's just used to express like, hey, something is wrong. There's an error, you the user needs to fix this, so. Um, so the next thing is exit handlers, which I don't have a lot of experience using, um, but uh, the book kind of talks about these. Uh, exit handlers are really kind of important in situations where functions need to make some type of temporary change, so like the global state. So I have an example, or the book had an example from this. So say if you need to like change your working directory or a function needs to change the user's working directory, it's best to make that change to the user's system and then revert back to the old like environment that the user was was working in and so that's where like exit handlers really come into play um but kind of an important thing with exit handlers is this idea is that functions should always clean up after themselves so you don't want to have an in, you don't want to make an inadvertent change to your user system that's using this function because that might have an effect later down the road that your user might have that may affect something later when they're trying to trying to create some type of program or something. Um, and so exit handlers or on.exit helps revert back to previous states. And so the big thing about exit handlers is, is that they're gonna run regardless of whether the function exit normally or there's an error. And so that's what this example is showing here. And so we have this function here, J06. Here, it's just doing this function called cat, which is just going to print. Um, and what it's going to do is basically, it's going to run this conditional here where it's either going to return a value 10 or it's going to say the word stop or do an error stop. Um, but then it's also going to always print this value goodbye. And so you can see here, we pass true into here. So it's going to say hello every time. But because of this conditional, we say true, it's going to stop or it's going to say goodbye and then return the value 10. Now, if we didn't have this exit handler here and we have this explicit error that happens, um, on.exit will still run this code regardless of the error happening. And so you can see this example here. If we do J06 false, 
the condition condition evaluates to the stop error, you'll get hello. The error happens, but it's always going to return goodbye. And so um, big thing about on.exit is that this code that you pass into an argument, regardless if there's an error in the function or the function breaks, it will always run that code at the end when the function gets done evaluating. Uh, like I was mentioning, this on.exit is useful when we need to clean up after ourselves. So this example is from the book. So say there's a situation where we need to change the working directory of the user. Um, that is a really, really bad thing to do because if you don't want to be changing your user's working directory, because if you change their working directory, then things aren't going to work in their program, especially like file names and the such. So um, just uh, in this case right here, what it's doing is it's taking the old directory and then on dot exit of this function run, it's going to set it back and change it back to the old directory. So um, what questions do people have about this function here? I mean, interesting. <laughs> I haven't really ever thought about the um, the on exit idea. I mean, in my own like work, I, I've I've done I've, I've put in stop you know stuff, but it's, it's interesting. Well, I think it's I think it's really important, especially like so. This is really important with like package development. Um, well, I shouldn't say just package development, but like it's really important to not so. How can I say this? So I don't know if both of you have read through the, the package book, but the package book basically is like your package or the functions that you create should never change anything from the user system when they use it. Right. And so if you're going to do that, you need to have an exit handler so that when a function stops running, it changes whatever things you change. So like, like system settings or like our settings. So you have the ability to like change settings with functions. You don't want to just have like a function change of setting that's going to influence anything. So you always should be cleaning up after yourself. And so that's where on.exit really comes into play. Yeah, that's cool. All right, cool. Um, but although I say it's important, <laughs> I, I don't always do it, but I guess I'm not really changing a lot of settings though. So I should keep that in mind. Um, so the other thing about this is that functions aren't necessarily just the common prefix functions that we see. Functions can take on many different forms. And so the book kind of talks about, uh, gives different examples of the four different forms that a function can take. And so, you know, we, we got to go back to the canonical, uh, uh, quote that everybody says from John Chambers, everything that exists is an object everything that happens in R is a function call. And so, um, but the four different types of function forms that are out there are prefix, infix, replacement, and special. And most of us are pretty familiar with prefix. Prefix is the one that most of us probably use or are the most familiar with. It looks like this, where we have the function name, and then we define the arguments inside of the parentheses, right? I think most of us are pretty familiar with this one. Uh, infix functions are a little bit different. Um, this basically is, is that the, uh, the arguments or the function goes in between the argument, the, the arguments themselves. Uh, so anything like mathematical operators um, are examples of infix functions. So plus, minus, multiplication, exponentiation, those are infix functions. Uh, so we can define our own in infix functions. And in fact, I have a couple of examples of this from a blog post that I saw that I thought was really interesting, but you can define your own infix functions with the percentages. Uh, there are replacement functions. Uh, these replace values by assignment. Uh, a good example of this would be like names, DF, assignment and assigning names. Um, I really am not real familiar with these outside of just this like names DF and then giving it different names, but I haven't seen any other replacement functions, but I would be interested to hear from the group if anybody has any like specific ones that they know. And then the last one would be the special, which would be things that we commonly use like um, bracket bracket for subsetting uh, special keywords like if or for um, for conditionals and for loops. 
And there's just a bunch of them that you can look up, um, but pretty much any of these like special kind of symbols or words or keywords that we use, those are special functions that are defined. So an important kind of characteristic of this is to know is, is that an interesting property of R is that every infix replacement or special form can be written in a prefix form. And so the book provides a few simple examples here uh, to kind of show this kind of property of, of the programming language. So here we have the infix function of addition or the plus sign. We can write this as a prefix with, with this, with just the, the back ticks plus and then the arguments here. Replacement, same thing. Um, we can do this is names df, which I'm, which I'm the one that which is the one that I'm most familiar with. Mm -hmm. But we can define it back into prefix using this names df and then pass x y z. Same thing for special. We can define it in prefix function like this, and then so it's a really kind of interesting property of this programming language. So. I mean, I, I'm trying to think of like, why would we want to use the prefix form? <clears throat> well, I think, oh, go, go ahead. ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead, Ron. Well, occasionally you have to pass a function into another function like a high, as a higher order function, in which case you might need to use the prefix way in order to refer to it. Like there's no way to like just pass in the, you know, I don't know why you'd want to use if, for example, but if you wanted to use like the bracket thing, Mm -hmm. I've seen that passed in as an as an argument to a some other like map or apply or something like that. Hmm. Interesting. In fact, this I can't remember where I saw, but when I did see. I, I was like, "What are they? What is going on here?" <laughs> I had no idea about this <laughs> this coding method. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm most familiar with prefix. That's just what I I know. But I mean you use a lot of infix ones a lot. I mean, the one that I probably use quite a bit is like the in, so like the percent in percent, yeah. um, especially for filtering. Like I yeah. use that one quite a bit. Oh, I thought he was talking about why would you want to use this, the prefix form? Like, right. Like, for, uh, you know, like why, you know, why would you want to be able to use the prefix form of four, for example? Oh, that's, oh, sorry. I misunderstood your question. Yeah. So the only one I can, I've seen is people use the prefix form of that special left bracket, left bracket thing. The subsetting operator. Yeah. It's a good question. I, I don't know. <laughs> but, That's one of the hard things about this book is like, I don't know about y'all, but like I keep running into these things where like he gives us these examples or he gives us these things and you can do this too. And you're kind of like, I don't know. It's like something I'm whatever he proposes. I've never done it before, but then I'm like, maybe I should be doing this. You know what I mean? So some of, and this is kind of an R thing, which is you know, there's many ways to do the same thing. And so I don't know if anyone else has had this experience, but like, you know, I, I like, um, I really like using case when you know to 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 do, um, you know, like sort of um categorization based on you know you know some other conditions you know but then like they're, they're, they're what was it switch was the name of the variable or you know so now it's like should i go use that i don't know i mean or is it you know should i choose what i'm comfortable with i'm always a little bit torn about that i don't know if that makes sense well my approach to these kind of things is that now i've seen it right at some point in the future i'm like man i wish there was a way to wait a minute I think there is. <laughs> Maybe I have a chance of pulling that out of my memory. <laughs> That's about it. Yeah. He gives one application of the infix form for uh, playing a dirty trick on your friends. Do you remember that from the book? <laughs> Redefining <laughs> the left parentheses <laughs> to, do, to occasionally oh. add an extra thing in there. Oh, I don't remember that. Yeah. He redefines I got, I... The... Oh, go ahead, Ron. Sorry. He redefines the parentheses operator so that occasionally it randomly adds one to uh, <laughs> to the thing you're you're concatenating or whatever i got another exam i got another example here that will help i think clarify yeah. that a little bit more but go ahead ryan no go ahead please I, I, that was it i was just that was okay. oh no we'll, we'll get to it we'll get to it but yeah like they're like <laughs> I don't know, like the flexibility is really nice, but it allows you to do some really, uh, really dangerous things. So, yeah. I, I, I mean, 
I think at the other point of it too, is like coming at this. Cause I got to remember that, like, I got to remember like who this book is written for. I, I, I had that reminder of myself yesterday of like, cause it was like, this is challenging material for me. And I'm like, who's this book written for? The audience of this book is people that are coming from other programming languages. Mm -hmm. And so it's showing like all of these weird characteristics that someone may come across, you know, to kind of understand some, like some more of those like general coding concepts that somebody may have come across in their language, but being applied in the R context. And because R is so flexible, like there's so many different ways to get to a specific solution, but. Mm -hmm. um, but that's my perspective of it. Cause I got a little frustrated because some of the questions that are in the exercises are just like so open-ended and I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm yeah, like why this doesn't this work? <laughs> yeah. Like, well, you know, explain why this, this function doesn't work or why this, yeah. I mean, it's true. I, I agree with you. So I get so frustrated with the questions. Cause I'm like, well, I should be able to read the section and answer the question, but it's like, no, you got to go do a little extra work and you got to dig into it. But then you got to remember, it's like, well, that's like, other people coming from other programming languages, that's what they would be doing, right? Is they would be going and figuring out some of the nuances and stuff. But I feel your pain, Ryan. I feel your pain. <laughs> sure. So um, I, we could talk a little bit more about the prefix form here and, and the book kind of dives a little bit more into this. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on the prefix form because we're pretty used to it. We use it quite most common or because it's the most common in R. But a couple of things to know about this is, is that there's some unique characteristics, especially regarding the arguments. And so you can specify arguments within your functions based on position. So here's the help function. Um, we can specify argument values based on position. So we don't have to explicitly say topic equals mean. Uh, here it also does partial matching, which I think is just, I. I don't understand why this would be available, but it is available. You can do partial matching here. Um, so again, we're looking at this argument topic to evaluate the mean function to get the help docs on it, but then by name, which we're most common with. I really dislike partial matching that that's available, but it is, um, but it's kind of interesting. Uh, position matching is really nice because um, your, first two, your first two arguments within a function you know, are probably going to be pretty standard within like a, a statistics programming language, right? You're probably going to be some data frame and some variable. And so it's kind of nice to have this by position as a little bit of a convenience. Uh, what gives a simple example? Let's use prefix form. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's a good example. Yep. That's a great example. Um, so some rules to follow, uh, use positional matching for the first one or two arguments, which I kind of talked a little bit about. Um, avoid positional matching for less commonly used arguments. So if you have like an argument that, you know, provides some additional computation that doesn't necessarily need to be used all the time, uh, you know, avoid positional matching with that one. And then the other thing is, and, and I think this is just, should be commonplace is just never use partial matching. Like that just seems really, really dangerous um, in this case. So any other additional questions about like how arguments are specified and how some of those rules apply to argument specification with the prefix form? Oh, this is, that was really good. Um, so now the infix form which I thought was really, really interesting. Um, so it gets its name because the function goes between the arguments. So uh, the, the best way I can think of it is like this, is this idea of you have your argument A on the left-hand side, you have your function, and then you have your argument B on the right-hand side. And so this is kind of just the general infix form. R has a bunch of built-in infix operators. Um, you can take a look at them and you can also define your own infix operator. So here's an example. It may not necessarily be useful, um, but here is just a an infix function that just pastes two string values together. And so here's our function. We give it the arguments A and B and we just pass it into paste. If you don't know paste, it just concatenates values together. And then it goes A, B. And so we pass this one string A new, and then here's our function, and then the second string, which is string, and then what gets returned from that function is new string. Now, I thought this was interesting, but um, I went out and there's this blog post, and I'll post it here in the chat, 
Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Colin Fay, but Colin Fay does a really good job of giving like different examples of um, infix functions and some different ways of how you can kind of play around with them. And so he provides some different examples here of how we can define different infix function into prefix form. And so here's the example of our vector, creating a vector of one through 10. We can specify it in the prefix form like this, one through 10, like this. Um, <clears throat> addition, two plus three, we can also express that in the prefix form two, three. But what's really, really interesting about this is because R is really, really flexible and gives us a lot of freedom is we can redefine any infix function. And so I thought this was really, really neat. Um, this Again, these are the examples from Colin Fay, and I highly suggest reading that blog post because it goes into a little bit more depth. But you can redefine the plus symbol. You have the flexibility to do that. So if you want to change the plus into a uh, multiplication, you can do it. And so now you can see here's the definition. Now if you do 2 plus 10, it's 20 rather than 12. And so because you've redefined that infix function. You also have the ability to um, change the infix function of the assignment arrow. And so you can use this dot primitive to pull up the definition of the plus infix function. And you can have it right here where it's two assignment three, but it's actually now going to be addition goes into five. And of course, you don't want to leave it like that. Uh, you want to redefine them to back to what they were. You can re restore it back. Um, what's also nice about infix functions. Yeah, another dirty trick you can do to somebody, Ryan, when you go, they leave their computer on. I was going to say, man, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting I'm getting cold sweats just looking at this. I I, I would never. I, I mean, I'm not I'm not ready to even try such a thing. But that's pretty cool. I, I just I I ain't doing it. But I, I do I do that. I think that's pretty cool though. I think it's just neat to see because like you have the flexibility to do it, right? Like whether it's whether you should or you shouldn't, it's like you have the ability to do it. So sure. just think if every one of your, just think if you'd like change this right up at the top of your, of somebody's like script, like it would just crash it. But anyways, um, so you can restore it back. And again, Colin Fay does a really good job in his blog post of describing this a little bit more, but what's really interesting about infix functions is you can use any character set inside of the parentheses to define it. So in our case here, what Colin Faye does is in this example is he uses the pizza, the pizza emoji to, to redefine D player slice. And so basically what we have here is slice just basically, it's just slices rows. So it says, give us like the first two rows. Um, so what it's doing is it's iris pizza slice two, and it returns that right there. Or it returns the second row, excuse me, because it slices it out, so. How do you type a pizza slice? My keyword doesn't have that. <laughs> yeah, you have to go. You have to do the copy and paste. But, ah. <laughs> but it's just I mean, kind it, of an. Go ahead. It has it has pizza sauce on it, but I don't think that's going to help. <laughs> I don't know. I just thought it was kind of funny because, like, basically, you can pass any character set inside of this, and it gets treated as an infix function. So, um, yeah, I highly suggest it's a really quick read, but. Um, and Colin Fay has got, he's got a lot of really good stuff on his blog regarding just like the R language itself, but he has a really good explanation of infix functions and really like really um, approachable examples that make it a little bit easier to like understand. So um, let's talk about replacement functions. Um, they basically act like they modify their arguments in place. They kind of take this special form uh, where it has like some uh, function definition and then the assignment operator. And the arguments must have an X and a value argument in it. And it must return the modified object. So in this case here, we're going to find this function called second. Here's the function. It has two arguments, X and value. Um, X, basically, we're just going to do some subsetting here and we're going to replace it with some value. And so we return that object back here because again, we're just implicitly returning it inside the function. And so here, let's just say we create X, this vector of one through 10. Let's say we wanna replace the second position with a um, five integer. We run it through here, second X as a replacement function and we return it back and we can see that five is, is returned in the second place. If we wanna change it to 10, we can do the same thing here. Um, 
But I mean, I open it up to the group. I really don't outside of like the names function. I don't really see any use of this. Wildly dangerous. But then I've been saying that all hours, so I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, these all seem like things you could easily shoot yourself in the foot with, right? But they're good to know. They're good to know because I'm sure there's somebody out there that, you know, probably has defined it this way. But I just, I, because I, because I come from the tidyverse, you know, it's like infix functions and, you know, standard assignment operation primitive, you know, not primitive functions, but in prefix functions. It's like, well, doesn't have to make the point that a lot of these things in here are things that he learned making tidyverse and that are useful for making things like tidyverse. So it is advanced R after all. So, so um, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just trying to, so basically, like, just, just so I can, like, maybe make sure I'm understanding this because I did read this, but of course, now, now that we're talking about it, I have <laughs> a little recollection of this part of the chapter. So we're basically saying we have an existing function with, you know, some arguments, and we want to change one of at least one of those arguments in place, quote unquote, which basically just means. We're not shutting down the function or changing the function. We're just changing. Um, well, really, it's the default, isn't it? Or well, wait, wait a minute. Actually, so yeah, maybe I, yeah, maybe I just don't understand it. I think of the way to think of it is is like this is this is its own function. Like this is its own function. And what we're doing is is to like use this function here. We have to, uh, okay, I got, okay. I think I see what you're saying. So, and what we have to do is we have to define this function on the left-hand side, pass it an argument X. And, and we also need a value to be passed along into it. And how we pass that value along into it is, with this assignment 5L. So this is actually the 5L. The 5L is the value argument. But wait a minute, no, isn't it because it's isn't it the X argument? Because you're saying for the for the the function second and the argument of X assign um 5L. By the way, I, I didn't mean to sound argumentative. I'm I'm literally no, <laughs> no. I I know. I'm I'm trying to understand this too. So yeah, don't yeah. Um, I well, I think the way I look at it is is like x is here. It's defined here as this vector of one through ten, and so x would get looked up into here, but then we don't necessarily. I don't know. Maybe I'm getting mixed up here too myself. Well, no, I see what you're saying. <sighs> are used by placing the function call on the left-hand side of this. So here's this one. Yeah, so no, I see your point because X, we, we we use the one through 10 to populate X. And then, so then I guess, um, so when we're assigning the 5L, is it because value is, is, is it hasn't been assigned that it just knows to assign 5L to value, but then, well, I think of it like this too. Like if we go back to this names example, do I have names back here? So like, uh, let me see if I can pull it up. Cause like, this is how you rename stuff, right? So like if you wanted to rename specific values. Yeah. Uh, yeah, here, here's the example that it shares. So like this right here. So here's the example from the book. So mm-hmm. here, so we have these values C, a1, B equals 2, mm-hmm. C equals 3, and names, which we can do names here in the prefix form. But then we can also, uh, maybe not. Substitute. No, yeah, because no, you can, because see what you're doing here is you're saying for the second value of the vector X, put 2 in there. So mm-hmm. we're out of time. I mean, it's, it's not, I don't want to like drag us down in a big rabbit hole. I'm just, you know, this is interesting. Um, but I, I don't think, yeah, I mean, so it's like, so basically you have to have an argument for the original vector, and then you have to have an argument value for the thing you're trying to change some part of 
the vector two, right? And I think that's where that rule comes in, where you must have you must have these two arguments, x and value, in your definition, because that's what you're basically doing. This just a right. replace replacing things. Right. And so in the in the example you gave above, like so you could say like all the x's are the left sides of the um equations, and then the values are all obviously the right sides, you know, for a, b, and c, right? I mean, so I, I mean, kind of, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, that's where like uh, that's where I struggle is because like the only way that I see this being useful is just like when we do names, like when you want to yeah. change names. <laughs> no, right? no. We're like I labels, don't... like label, variable labels. Words, variable like, labels, yeah, yeah. Yeah, where it's like you have an attribute that you're trying to assign to a bunch of things. But anyway, well, yeah. Well, even the simple thing like X of three goes to 44, that type of thing is translated internally into that, you know, bracket this thing right that's yeah, the that makes sense it's called um you know with x3 value equals 33 or something like this right i mean that's <laughs> so yeah so basically what i'm is is effectively is a replacement function right i yeah. mean yeah you so know. I, it's, if you ever have to write something like that that now you know how but i just don't see any immediate use for it myself either it's like a lot of these things in this chapter are, are kind of like it's comprehensive um but not so easy to comprehend yeah, <laughs> you guys, let's just run this back next week. Let's just do a whole other, a week on replacement function. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's <that's> not. <laughs> <Just teasing. laughs> I no. think I'm. I think I'm good with names. I think we're good. I think we're good. Yeah, I'm good with it. Well, hey, um, yeah, I got. Let's um, we can maybe run the, the special forms. If you, I mean, we can either do that next week or we can skip it or whatever. But um, I'll be ready next week. Yeah, I think this is a good stopping point. Yeah, I can special forms are really easy. It's basically yeah. like, yeah, we can talk about it for like two minutes and be done with yeah. it. Um, but yeah, so next week we'll talk about environments. Ryan, you'll be in charge of it. Um yeah. other than that, well, um, I mean I can hang out here for a little bit if Ryan, if you got extra questions or stuff you want to talk about, but no, nope, yeah, I'm good. I think that's, Thank you. All right, cool. Well, it's gonna be very interesting. Yeah, we'll see everybody yeah. next week. Okay, Bye. good deal. All right, have a good one. Bye.